You know, what's really great about having these guys here tonight is, you know, I'm not just the weirdest pastor on earth. There's, uh, there's more of us. And <laughs> it's not just me. We all have the same disease. Isn't that fun? Okay, well, tonight I, I do have a great privilege. And uh, my privilege is to introduce our speaker, uh, Dan Cox. He's the pastor of Canyon View Vineyard in Grand Junction. And... Um, you know, I don't know how to do introductions, but I love introducing my friends. Dan is a friend of mine. He has reached out to me so many times um, to encourage me, uh, to help me. Uh, I am so proud of him. I am, how many of you are from Canyon View? Raise your hands. We love your church, and we're so proud of what God is doing in Grand Junction. You know, Dan never says it. Nobody ever talks about it. But one of the things I want to change right now is I want us to celebrate what God is doing in our churches and, um, and sometimes we feel jealous or envious, and I want you guys to know we're not. We're, we're just so glad for you and how God has prospered you and blessed you. You know, they're by far the, the largest vineyard in, in our region, and it's come from a group of people and led by Dan that just keeps seeking God and saying yes to God and, and saying the hard things, and, and they're, they've moved outside of themselves. They reach out to their community. They've opened their doors to lost and hurting people, and they continue to say yes and to learn and to grow. And, uh, and really, they, I feel like they're a trophy in our, in our movement, and I'm glad that you guys are in our region, and it's my privilege to, to be a part of your church and your lives, and, uh, and we want to learn from you guys, and, uh, and I, I'm really thank, I really thank God uh, for Canyon View, and, and Dan is, uh, is a special kind of leader. He's just one of these guys that just keeps saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And God has grown him up and grown him up and grown him up. And he's a tremendous leader in our movement and in our region. And I want you to welcome Dan Cox as he comes and shares with you tonight. Thanks, Rick. We have, we have some outlines and we need some ushers to come and help us pass out here tonight. We need to, go up? That's already, Hans? We have guys already do that? Now's the time to do it. Well... Hello, everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, I have a blooper. I told a couple of them this morning, but uh, this is one of my favorite ones. And it's, it's a special type of person who likes to humiliate themselves in front of other people. But anyway, that's kind of the sickness that goes with this job. Uh, we were up in the hills in uh, Crested Butte with some friends and uh, having a lovely time. And the uh, husband calls on the phone and says, uh, Dan, I've really got some bad news. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, Curiel's dog, Bonnie, has just been run over, and she was killed. And do you think it would be best if uh, I come up and tell her, or do you think it's best that you tell her? Which is always, you know, a pastor's prerogative to get to give the bad news. So uh, I told her, him, I said, Steve, you know, it's probably the best thing that I do is I, I tell Curiel. And he says, I want you to know she is going to be devastated, absolutely devastated. And so I said, uh, well, I, I think I can handle that. So, so I went in the room and I said, uh, Curiel, I've really got some really bad news. And I have to tell you something really. And she just kind of froze there. And I said, uh, your dog, Bonnie, was just killed. And she just broke and wept and, and being the kind of compassionate pastor I went over and put my arms around her and started to pat her and said doggone <laughs> now I want you to know that that broke uh, the grieving of the moment and there's a certain time to use humor, and uh, she has never let me forgot, forget that, and so therefore, um, and I mean to tell you, friends, I could go all night with stuff like that, so anyway. Well, I want to share with you tonight about um, Rick's, uh, what he's called this conference, and I think it's so right, uh, Building a Legacy That Matters. And tonight I want to talk about renewing our hearts and what it is to have our, our hearts renewed. Um, 
I don't know how many of you were here this morning when, when Rick spoke. And it's uh, one of those times, uh, have you ever had this happen to you when you're, uh, when you're in an auditorium somewhere and somebody begins to speak and it's like nobody else is around and you're the only person there and, and you think, uh, why did anybody else come? And uh, I, don't, I don't remember the title of your message this morning, Rick, but uh, I remember all ten points. And uh, my broken life was in all ten. And, uh, you, know, and, 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 you know, even at the point of writing this down, you know, like at point number nine, I was kind of saying to God, you know, uh, nine out of ten isn't bad. If you just want to let the tenth one go, you know, we don't have to do that. But sure enough, ten was in there. And I honestly feel this way, uh, Friends, I, and I'm not trying to uh, be facetious in this, although it'll probably come out that way. Um, I feel like kind of the Gomer Pyle of Vineyard. I mean, honestly, I walk into our church sometimes and uh, I go, golly, um, who's the pastor of this place? And sometimes I feel more like, uh, like the spectator than I do the participant. And I, I, I'm saying that for a reason, is because um, and, and my, my staff, my wife, my kids uh, know that there's lots of areas of my life that are broken, uh, that needs God's grace on it every day. I have found this to be very true in my life, if that God's hand is not on me every moment, I'm a jerk, absolute jerk. And when, uh, when God's hand is there, when God is, uh, is, is doing something in your life, you just recognize that this really has very little to do with you, but has a whole lot to do with God. And that's the way I feel. I, I honestly feel, I, I, uh, I just uh, marvel at the grace of God that still works through lives that are imperfect. And I think that that puts us all in the ballgame. I think it all puts us there. Um, I don't know about you, but there's times in my life when I've been hooked into things that uh, were not God. How about you? And the things that you just recognize, boy, I wished I wouldn't have gone down that path, but I went down that path. And you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with renewal? Well, I want to read to you a story about getting hooked into something that you wished you wouldn't have gotten hooked into. Listen to this. It happened at a traffic light near the edge of town. A man gunned the engine of his huge Harley Davidson. Now, I've just gotten a Harley a year ago, so I really identify with this guy. As he waited for the light to change, you might have been tempted to stare at this guy. You would have enjoyed it. A filthy rag was fastened around his head. From beneath it, it was a matted tangle of gray hair spilled down the back of his leather jack. Images of skulls and bones leered from his clothing and his uh, bare forearms. And his bike bore the emblem of a a menacing black widow spider. As he waited at the light, an elderly man on a lime green moped pulled up beside him. The ringy ding ding of the moped was drowned out by the roaring thunder of the Harley. Boy, that's some kind of motorcycle you got there, the old man choked. Mind if I take a closer look? Scowling from behind his oily beard, the biker gave him once over. If it turns your crank, old timer, he snarled, go ahead. The old man was a little farsighted, uh, but he wanted to take all in all the scenery, so he leaned his face right over the bike and examined every inch. Looking up after a while, the old man grinned and said to the biker, I bet that miter- motorcycle really goes fast. But no sooner were the words out of his mouth, the light changed, and the biker thought he showed his, this old geezer what a real chopper could do. He gave it full th- throttle, and within 30 seconds, the speedometer read 199 miles an hour. He chuckled with satisfaction. Certainly, suddenly he noticed a dot in his rearview mirror, a dot that was growing larger. Something was gaining on him. What could it be? He slowed down to get a better look, and whatever the thing was flashed past him so quickly he couldn't identify it. The thing disappeared over the horizon and then whipped around and came right back at him. As he zipped past, he recognized the rider. It was the old man on the lime green moped. (laughs) How could this be? The biker took another look into the rearview mirror. There was the speck again, coming back his way, growing larger. The biker tried to outrun it, but he couldn't be done. 
It was a moot point, for in the seconds, the moped slammed in the rear of the Harley-Davidson. The collision destroyed both bikes. You could hear the impact for miles. The biker extracted himself from the mangled steel pretzel that once was his beloved Harley-Davidson. But the old man had fared even worse. He lay groaning beneath the black, smoking remnants of his moped. Even the hardened biker was moved with compassion. He knelt beside the old man's face and softly asked, Is there anything I can do for you? The old man choked and coughed and replied, Yes. Could you please unhook my suspenders from your handlebars? <laughs> Ever been hooked in something you didn't want to get involved with? Um, flexibility. You know, I love being flexible. I used to be that way, and the older I get, the less flexible I become. And one of the things that I really love about the vineyard, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight a lot, is, is the vineyard, uh, is the ability and um, the strength that it has to flex. And probably the strength of the, of the vineyard is its flexibility, but also the weakness of the vineyard is probably its flexibility. Because we can find ourselves flexing into things that aren't God. Not only is that true for the vineyard, but that's true for us as individuals, is that we can see certain things in other churches and we can go, I want, it, I want that in my church. And I have found out uh, two things that I think really are two words that really mean a lot to me, and that is systemic and an appendage. And there are things that I've put my hand on that are appendage to us that never works out. But when things are systemic that you see in other churches that really are a part of your church culture, then you put them into your church culture and it really does work because it's who you are. And I just have found this out, that God raises up certain movements, uh, even certain churches that speak to the larger body of Christ. And in those, you can pick and choose and say, you know, I'd really like to be like that. But you really have to be careful if that's in your spiritual genetic code or not. Because if it's not, it can really become a detour that costs you a lot of time, energy, and money in your churches. And uh, to, to my surprise, early in my uh, pastorate, or however you want to call it, um, you know, it's still hard for me to even look at myself as a pastor. When, I, uh, when people come up to me and call me Pastor Dan, I just kind of want to turn around and I wonder who they're talking to, you know. I just, I'm not comfortable with that yet. Um, but anyway, um, uh, when God raises up certain movements and you begin to see what God's doing in a certain place, one of those places that God really spoke to me, and I, I, I want to go back to the point of really, really um, underscoring the whole idea that God speaks. God talks. He's a talker. And all of us have heard God's voice. And uh, one of the movements that I believe that God has raised up uh, was the vineyard. And the vineyard spoke to me in, um, in a really critical time of my life. And as this story unfolds tonight and why it's important to have our hearts renewed, is because I saw the vineyard as a renewal movement, but probably not in the classic sense that some of us think of renewal. And I really want to clarify the word renewal for you tonight because I am not talking about anything other than what I'm going to describe for you because I really thought that the vineyard was a movement of renewal in the area of relevancy. It was relevant. Now let me tell you why it really spoke to me. Uh, because I was raised in a church and I thank God for the heritage that... that um, I have in the church. As a matter of fact, my mother tells this story about me. She said, uh, the first time you ever stayed awake in church, you got saved. <laughs> so, you know, I was, I was raised in church. Um, man, I've seen it all. Uh, you know, I was raised in Pentecost and you name it, and, and I've seen it. And, uh, and, and this is really hard for me to say, uh, but I would never invite my friends to that church. And the reason why, it was too weird. People would ask me, what's going on? And I couldn't explain it. And I know as a young guy. And I know that the people there loved God. As a matter of fact, I know that the, the pastors in that church loved God. 
But friends, it was not relevant to the culture that we were living in. And, and my pastor at this time was a guy that really did try to reach out to the community. And he used to do this thing called the strange happenings at the tomb. And he would have a, uh, a tomb. I mean, actually, I've, I've been to the tomb there in Jerusalem, walked in and go, this is just exactly like the one in Grand Junction. No kidding. I mean, it was identical to it. And he'd fill that place three times and preach the gospel and, and people would come to the Lord and stuff like that. But there was just so much stuff that was happening in there that uh, I just couldn't identify with. And uh, as I came to the Lord, and uh, I'll, I'll tell more of that story here in just a little while, I, I recognized that when I got into the vineyard, here was somebody by the name of John Wimber. I didn't even know what his name was. I couldn't even pronounce his name. And it's a long story how I got him to the vineyard. But uh, John was a guy that gave young men an okay to be who they were. Um, he said you could, you could dress normally. You could speak in a normal tone. Uh, you could play music that you like. And when I walked into uh, Tom Stipe's church, Matter of fact, I just passed it coming up here. It was that old bingo. It, it's a, what was it? A, a bingo parlor now. It was a liquor store back then, wasn't it? And uh, walked into that place and I just go, oh, man. It's so relevant. And, um, and I, I, I want you to be so, so clear tonight of the renewal process that I still think that the vineyard is speaking to the larger body of, of Christ is to be relevant to the culture without giving up the message. Now, let me tell you something about John Wimber. This is my personal opinion. I was just shocked last night to hear uh, Burt Wagner say that 50% of the people in the vineyard now don't even know who John Wimber was or never met him, which is understandable because we've grown so much. But here's what John Wimber did. He contextualized the church to the culture better than anybody that I've ever known. And gave us permission to really be people that go out and invite our friends to church. And I, I just want you to think about this. That is the basis of what I believe that God has done in my life. Is that I, I always wanted a church where people could bring their friends to where they wouldn't feel embarrassed about what went on. And that's what I felt about Wimber. That's what I felt about what was going on in the vineyard is that we could be a culturally relevant movement that spoke to the larger body of Christ, but more importantly, to the community out there that we serve in, that we love, that they could actually be a part of our, our, the body of Christ, of the family. Uh, Jesus really starts to address this whole issue about uh, renewal in Matthew. As a matter of fact, if you want to turn your Bibles to Psalm 87, and then just let me talk to you about this whole thing about here in Matthew for just a moment, is that there's uh, three different types of disciples that uh, are, is happening in Jesus' day. One was the Pharisees, the other one John the Baptist, and then the third one was the Lord's disciples. And one day, uh, John the Baptist's disciples comes to the Lord and saying, hey, uh, we don't get this. We have to fast and pray and the Pharisees have to fast and pray, but your disciples don't have to fast and pray. And I, we kind of want to know why. And I think that the personal opinion was is that we like yours a lot better because your guys get to eat. <laughs> but that's a personal opinion there. And so Jesus kind of answers that. And uh, I'd like to read it to you out of Matthew uh, chapter 9, verses 14. Because he really then begins to address this whole idea of renewal. And then I want to explain to you what I think the Lord was talking about here in renewal. Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we, the Pharisees, fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus answered, How can be the guest of the bridegroom mourn while he is still with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk uh, cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. And verse 17 is really what I want to talk about. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the wineskins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are 
preserved. Now, Jesus is really saying a mouthful here about the whole idea of renewal. And I really want to talk about the area of the wineskins because it's really talking about the parameters, the parameters that we even put on ourselves, the parameters that are around maybe even our churches that we don't realize that are cold and hard and that need to be renewed. So here's what would happen in those days. They would take some kind of an animal skin and they would make a pouch out of it. And so that when they poured the, the wine in, what would happen is the wine would ferment, the pouch would expand, and then the sides, the parameters would become hard. They would drink the wine, but if they did not renew the wine skin, then what would happen the next time when they poured the wine in, it fermented, it expanded, it would break, and that's what Jesus is talking about. So how are the wine skins renewed? Well, let me tell you how the wine skins were renewed. Good question, wasn't it? Uh, Glad you asked it. They would take the wineskin and they would go to a stream and they would put the mouth of it. Now, this is just full and rich of symbolism here. They would put the mouth of it upstream so that the water, symbolic of the Holy Spirit, would run through it, soften the wineskins, and they would become pliable again. So that when the new wine came in, it didn't expand. And Jesus is saying to the Pharisees here, and he is, he is saying to uh, John the Baptist's disciples, he's saying, look, guys, my guys are going to go through a renewal. When they go through a renewal, it's going to be tough on them. As a matter of fact, I think he was talking prophetically what was going to happen on the day of Pentecost. Spirit of God's going to come on. He's going to expand them in a new way that they've never been expanded before. And they're going to have to go through renewal. And I guess this is the question that comes to all of us um, that we just have to ask ourselves. Are we resistant to the renewal of what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives simply because, and, and get, get a hold of this word, because we're comfortable where we live? See, I, I think one of the greatest problems that we have in our society today when it comes to the church is that the church is just becoming extremely comfortable. And the reason that it's becoming comfortable is because we have a society today that preaches to us the highest value in your life is to be comfortable. And I have found this to be very true about God. He is far more interested in my character than he is in my comfort. And he will put me through things that I would never, ever put myself through. And that's why we call him Lord. You know, I found this out about God is uh, he's a really hard guy to deal with. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. It's hard to play cards with somebody that owns the whole deck. And we always go to God and say, you know, I'll, I'll make this kind of a deal with you. And you just realize you don't deal with God. He says, you know, this is the way I want things done. And thus we call him Lord. And that means that I have to go through some uncomfortable times in my life. And that means that you're going to have to go through some uncomfortable times in your life. And when God says, you know, and all of us can kind of feel this oh, change, you know, this season that's coming into our life. And we're going, oh, I know this is going to cost something. <laughs> and we start going through the renewal. Now, now, let, let me tell you this, what I'm saying here, friends. Uh, and I really want to be honest with this. Is that uh, once you get through the change, uh, it is far worth whatever the price is rather than staying the same. And I, I want to change. But sometimes, boy, I mean to tell you, change is so difficult because we find out the niches in our life that are comfortable. Well, I think that Psalms 87 really speaks to this whole issue about where God's heart is in renewal. And so I want to read it to you. Psalm 87. He has set foundation on his holy mountain. The Lord loves the gates of Zion, which is what? The people of God. It's the community that Bird's been talking to us about. More than all the dwellings of Jacob, glorious things are said of you, O city of God. I will record Rahab and Babylon among those who acknowledge me. Phyllis too, and Tyre along with Cush. And we'll say this one was born in Zion. Indeed, of Zion, it will be said, this one and that one was born in her. 
And the Most High himself will establish her, and the Lord will write in the register of the people, this one was born in Zion. As they make music, they will sing, all of my fountains are in you. If you have your little outlines you want to follow along, let's take a look at five suggestions that will encourage your heart to renewal. Five suggestions that will encourage your heart for renewal. I lost my Bible tonight. Bruce, thanks for letting me use this. Number one is this. Maintain connection with the foundations that God has already placed within you. Maintain connection with the foundations that God has already placed within you. Listen to this in verse 1. He has set his foundation on the holy mountain. Now, especially for we guys, it's probably going to take some real visceral work, but all of us need to do some inventory of the foundations that God has put in in our lives. Um, I teach this in our church 101. It's interesting that Rick's talking about 101 this next uh, couple of weeks. And what we really try to do in 101 is to tell them what our uh, spiritual genetic code is. And, and friends, I, I really want you to think about this one. Every one of us have a spiritual genetic code that God has placed within you. And then he does things in your life to say, this is kind of where I want your life to go. And the more you begin to think about it, the more you realize that there really is a divine destiny on each one of us. But it's just like the Apostle Paul said to Agrippa. He said, I was obedient to the vision that God gave me, meaning that he could have been disobedient to it. And one of the things that I learned during the prophetic movement during the uh, vineyard days that we were going through that was that just because you get a prophetic word does not necessarily mean it's going to come to pass. It has a lot to do with your obedience to that word that God has given you. And so uh, when we're going through Church 101, I tell the people this very story. I said, if you do not understand Cheryl and I's spiritual genetic code, you will never understand where this church is going. And friends, I have just found this to be very true. If you don't tell people up front what the agenda of your church is, they'll make one up for you. And they'll try and get you to go some other path, and you just don't want to go that path. You want to stay true to the foundations that God has put in your life. 1971, Cheryl and I took off for Youth with a Mission in Lausanne, Switzerland. And we kind of figured, uh, well, at this time, and I don't have time to go into the story, I really know what it is to be a prodigal. I think that's why I have so many prodigals in our church back at home, is because I really did have an experience with the Lord in that church that I was telling you about earlier. And I really met the Lord, and I was probably 8, 9, 10 years old. And I really came to the Lord. I just had one of those experiences where uh, I met Jesus. I met Jesus on a Tuesday night. And man, I, I was so cleansed. And you think of a kid that's eight years old that really hasn't done all that much stuff. I want you to know I needed forgiveness. And I just walked out of that place just radically changed. Well, I took a detour in my life, a huge one. Went into real rebellion in my life. And uh, to make a long story short, I was invited by a friend to go to this SOE in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland. I love with my wife and girlfriend at that time, fiance. And I, and I said, uh, let's get married and go to Switzerland and, and see the world. Now, see, I, I could fake anybody out when it came around to Christian stuff. I mean, I could talk the language. I could, I could give you scripture. I could do all this kind of stuff. But I want you to know uh, I was what you would call a classic schizophrenic because I had two different lives going on. I mean, I had one life that was going on at church and everybody thought I was one certain kind of person. But when I was in the world, man, I was a whole different character. And so I went to Switzerland actually thinking that I was going to go see the world. And uh, I didn't know that Jesus took an earlier flight. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got there at that school and... Um, I know what it is to come home. I know what it is to come home and uh, find acceptance and forgiveness and love. And my heart just warms around those prodigals that have been away and they just come back and they just they find the Lord. And you find out that, you know, uh, Luke 15 is so true about the prodigal. He didn't get judgment. He got acceptance. He got forgiveness. Well, from there, uh, we took off to Afghanistan. 
after three months and then a Mideast field trip, three months there in Lausanne and then a Mideast field trip. We take off to Afghanistan, to Kabul, Afghanistan with 15 other people. And the reason that we're going there is because we're going to minister to the uh, hippies. Now, in, the, in those days, in the, in the hippie generation, what had happened is that they had the hippie trail that started in northern Africa, went through the Middle East, uh, through Turkey, into Iran, uh, into Afghanistan, up over the Khyber Pass, and into uh, India and Nepal and all those places where people were seeking truth. And at any one time, there were thousands of young people in Kabul, Afghanistan, that were seeking truth. And actually, the point of it was is they, they could live there for about 25 cents a day and have any kind of drugs they wanted. And so we would go out during the days, and we would invite these people up to our coffee house and then spend all night with them talking about the Lord. And it was huge. Now, Cheryl and I were... Uh, really straight. Now, I know that that has a whole different meaning today than it did back then, but we were never in the drug culture. And yet, every time we were around these people, lots of times, these counterculture people would seek us out for our counsel. And we would, we would really enjoy talking to them, and we would just have this incredible time. I didn't realize at that time that God was speaking to me about a spiritual genetic code, a foundation that he had actually put in me for what we are actually doing today. It took me years to figure this out. As one of the, matter of fact, one of the things that I started thinking about back then, and I never really put the thought together, was why in the world were all these Western young people in Kabul, Afghanistan, you know, from the richest, most wealthy nation in all the world in the history of man, and yet they were rebelling against it. And I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't figure out what was going on. I, was, I met a guy by the name of Steve one day. And I mean to tell you, I'm green. And what I mean by that, I, I'm, I'm green in, in knowing God's word. I, I'm, I'm green in talking to people about the Lord and that kind of stuff. So I went up to, to Steve, and he was on the porch of this, uh, of this uh, hotel, high on drugs. And so I uh, just said, hey, what's going on? And uh, introduced myself. And uh, he said, well, I'm Steve. And I said, well, Steve, uh, just to start a conversation, how's your parents? And he looked at me uh, with some of the coldest eyes I think I've ever seen in my life. I'll never forget this conversation. And he said, uh, the happiest day in my life was when my parents were killed in an automobile wreck. And all I can remember is my mind going blank. And I turn around and I walked back to the hotel because I didn't know what to say. And I mean to tell you, I was, I was stirred for those, those kids. And I didn't even know what was going on. I mean, I didn't even have a, a sense that this was God actually doing something in my life. So we come back home from Kabul, Afghanistan. Now, we're talking about foundations and things that God puts in our life so that we know that we're actually on track. And so finding out that what those foundations are and then staying in those foundations actually brings renewal to our life. So we come back from Afghanistan, and I'm thinking, I'm going back home, set up shop with my dad. He's already in business, and, uh, you know, help the local church. Come back to Lausanne, Switzerland. The, the uh, leadership there met Cheryl and I and said, uh, we'd like you guys to pray about going up to Germany and open up some coffee houses. Now, remember this. This is in the Jesus People Movement. This is 1971. A lot of kids are coming to the Lord. Things are breaking out in California. And so this, this Jesus, I mean, it's a worldwide thing that's beginning to take place. So we prayed about it and felt like we were supposed to go up there. And so we went up to Germany and started opening up uh, coffee houses up in, in Germany and started talking to the uh, GIs. And to our amazement, now the only thing that was different about these GIs from the people that we were talking about in Afghanistan and talking to in Afghanistan is they had shorter hair and wore green outfits. But they had exactly the same questions and problems as the kids in Afghanistan. And we found ourselves, again, uh, around these kind of people just connecting and just spending wonderful times and our hearts being broken, and I really mean that, about their condition. So uh, finally we get home and uh, we come to the church that I was raised in and uh, a wonderful man is pastoring the church and there's a young man in the church by the name of Rick Tomasi. Never forget Rick. Um, drug addict. As a matter of fact, he would call Cheryl and I on the phone, and you would think that we would have called him. You know, he would call and, 
and say, hi, Dan, this is Rick. Hi, Rick, how you doing? And then there's this long pause, and you'd have to say, uh, Rick, you called us. Oh, oh, yeah. And it's just because his mind was just so eaten up with drugs. And uh, he would go out. He came to the Lord in just a radical way. And he, he would just go out and in his broken way just share Jesus. And let me just stop and say this. Every one of us have a story. Every one of us have a story. And he would just go out and share Jesus with his friends. And uh, in about a two or three month period, he had about 60 to 70 kids. Now, there's an important lesson to what I'm about ready to tell you here is because all those kids started coming to this church that I was telling you about. But I want you to know there were two separate cultures. And it was very difficult for this church to assimilate those kind of kids into the culture. And lots of times what we got from people in the church was, did you know that so-and-so was smoking? And, we, and Cheryl and I would say, that's the least of their problems. <laughs> Believe you me, that's the least of their problems. Leave them alone. And uh, now you have to understand at this part of the story here that I understood now what worship was. I understood what teaching was. I even understood what small groups was. I even understood what evangelism was. I understood all those dynamics now that are taking place in our church, but it was just kind of in this embryonic state. And I realized at that particular time that um, probably some changes had to come, but I had absolutely no idea where to go. How many of you have ever heard of a field promotion? You know what a field promotion is? A field promotion is, is like when you're out in battle and your lieutenant gets uh, killed or injured and you're a sergeant, you take over as lieutenant, and that's called a field promotion. Cheryl and I were in this small church. We had left the church we were in, and we were in this small church, and uh, it had gone through a number of splits. And um, so they came to us, and Cheryl and I, and said, uh, why don't you guys do some teaching and preaching for us until uh, till we can get somebody in here to take over the church. And we said, uh, that sounds good. And actually, um, guys, I really look forward to preaching. I just kind of cringe at, at the, or cringe at what I did to the people uh, in those days. Because I know that those sermons went for an hour, an hour and a half, and people were sleeping and all the rest of it. But I was really getting fed, you know, and I was having a good time up there. And uh, for the first two years, now this, we were an interim. They were looking for somebody uh, that we were doing this. I would never allow people to call me pastor. And the reason why I wouldn't let people call me pastor is because my identification was with a pastor was a guy with a three-piece suit and a bouffant hairdo. <laughs> and I knew I wasn't that. And yet at the same time, I recognized those men were men of God, but it wasn't me. It wasn't my spiritual genetic code. Uh, fast forward from there. I, I don't know how many of you know, but my, my lovely wife is fighting MS. Uh, I've been doing it for about 22 years now. And uh, we heard about this guy by the name of John Wimber and how he's praying for the sick. And uh, we, we, we found out about this conference that was going up there at Tom's church. And so we thought we'd come over and check it out. And little did I know that when I walked into that church that God was going to speak to me about a model that was relevant to the culture that was in that I didn't even know existed. And it was called Vineyard. Uh, I, wa I walked into that room and it was like, I'm home. I'm home. I, I leaned over to Cheryl. And I'll, I'll never forget this. Uh, Tom, God loved Tom, whatever Tom's done in the vineyard, but God loved Tom, came out. And he goes, ah, he just begins to talk. You know, in the worship like we've experienced tonight in the room that we're kind of in this morning, and I leaned over to Cheryl, and I said, I can do that. I can do that. And that was a foundation that God put in me. And friends, I want you to know something this, tonight. God has put a foundation in you, and if you don't stay with that foundation, you will never find renewal. Because I can't get enough of what God does when he shows something else to me of how we as a church can relate to our culture. Number two is this. Are you with me? Yes. 
You have to acknowledge that every so often because I get really insecure and then I preach longer. <laughs> Number two, uh, discover renewal at the gates of the kingdom. Listen to this in verse two. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the, the dwellings of Jacob. Gates speaks of an entrance and God says he loves this place more than any other. We're really trying to be a church to the unchurched. And we need to discover ways to enter into that culture. How many of you have ever seen the movie uh, Jesus of Nazareth? Uh, if you haven't, you need to go see it. And, or uh, You can't go see it. You have to rent it. Um, and in this movie, the director really captures something that I really want to pinpoint about why God loves the entrance, the places where people come in to his kingdom more than any of the, of the other places of Jacob. I mean, that's what the Bible says. Uh, in this movie, he shows the party that Matthew throws for Jesus. Now, remember this, that Matthew has actually been watching Jesus around Capernaum probably for about six months. He's never heard anybody speak like this man speaks. He's never seen somebody that can open uh, blind eyes. He's never heard anybody... Uh, talk with such authority as this man. And so he's kind of enamored with this guy, and so he's going to throw a party. And when he throws a party, this guy on this, this director really shows it like I think it was. And it was like uh, you have the belly dancers. You know, you have the, the wine and the, and the beer. I know that that's not real uncommon to Rick's church, but anyhow... <laughs> That's why you just have to take a poke. But anyway. Uh, I have a microphone the, <laughs> too. <laughs> Turn his mic off, please. Uh, and, and, and all this, what we would call debauchery, is going on. And then they pan over to Jesus. Now, while I'm watching this, I have a tension that's going on in the inside of me. And it's like, here's holy Jesus in the midst of a bunch of sin. See, and we have two cultures that are meeting together, and yet Jesus is engaging the culture. I, I would probably ask you this question tonight. Do you suppose he probably heard some dirty jokes? Do you suppose he probably saw some gesturing that go on that probably, but this is not exactly how I intended that to go when I created this whole thing? He probably had some real moments of tension there, but his love for the culture was greater than what his tensions that he, were going, he was going through. Uh, I have these conversations regularly in our church, and it renews me because I know at some point, and believe you me, friends, we do a lot of things wrong in our church, a bunch of things. But one thing that has been built in us is that we're always going to be a church that reaches out. And uh, I have this lady comes in. She's a teacher. I know her quite well. And I'm standing out there in the lobby. And we as a pastoral staff try to greet people when they come in and say, hi, how are you doing? And, uh, you know, people are always wanting us to know their names, and I don't know them. And I just, I just have to tell you, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Tell me. And it doesn't really matter because I won't remember it anyway, but go ahead. <laughs> and I don't mean that unkindly, but it's just the truth. And, uh, I mean, I can't remember a week ago, let alone what some people's names are. So this gal comes in, and she's, uh, she says, uh, I got something I need to tell you. I said, okay, what is it? She said, me and my boyfriend just got married last weekend. And the reason why is because uh, we just couldn't stand to live in sin anymore. And I was just... So moved by that. As a matter of fact, when I, when I think about that right now, it moves me. And the reason why it moves me is I'm so proud of our church is because we have a church that loves people where they are. You know, we could have condemned them. As a matter of fact, uh, Scott and Susan are here uh, that lead our, our premarital. And it really is about the unchurched. Because, you know, it's, it's not even about the unchurched anymore. It's about the church. You know, how many people in the church are living together? My goodness. And it's just, and we preach. You know, one of the problems with the vineyard is this, is perception. And the perception is, is because we're casual, therefore we're liberal. And it's not true at all. 
I mean, we pre- I haven't heard anybody in the vineyard that just says, you know, poo poo sin. I mean, they really talk about sin as this is not a good deal for you. It's going to rob you. It's going to destroy you. Don't get into it. And yet I love the fact when I hear people that, as a matter of fact, I can think of a guy right now that is on our staff that came to me and said, I was in in your church a year before I met the Lord. You know what I do? I go, yes! Because that means that people are loving people where they are. We have another couple in our church, and she came to me, and she's been living with her boyfriend, who is a doctor. And now she's probably five or six months long when she comes into my office. And she goes, uh, I know we've been doing things wrong. But I really want to do it right. What would you suggest we do? And I said, well, you know, really to do it God's way is probably the best thing for you to do is just to, to move out. And then, because uh, I know you love Mark, that you want to go ahead and get married. And she said, I, I just can't do that. I don't have the money. I can't do that. I said, well, okay, here's my other suggestion. Don't go to number three because I don't have one, but I hope this one works. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, why don't you just move down the hall until, uh, until we can arrange this? I mean, you know what your conscience is. You know what to, is right and wrong. You and Mark know what's right and wrong, and you can, you can do what your conscience is telling you to do. And she said, okay, that works. I want you to fast forward from there. They did get married. They have become such an integral part of our church. Uh, he invites all of his doctor friends. Talk about a redeeming value in, in something that's just absolutely incredible. And uh, uh, he went to Uruguay. And he came back to me. And he went down there on a missions trip with a, a bunch of other doctors. And he, he, come up, he came up to me and he goes, ah, you know, Dan, I really think that God could be calling me into missions. I've never experienced anything like I've experienced praying for people and ministering. He says, I know that my hands have been gifted by God to heal people. And I think back if we would have been a white and black church in the context of what is right and what is wrong and not love them, we could have missed an incredible impact on the kingdom of God because we would have scared them out of the church. Love, you know. God loves the entrances. Now, let me, let me tell you why. You know why we're, we're uncomfortable with people in our church that aren't, quote, living a holy life? Uh, and this, this really doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this thing out, but the community of the kingdom is the church. You know, or the, or the church is the community of the kingdom. But it is not the kingdom, friends. And Jesus, as a matter of fact, said at one point, you let the wheat and the tare grow together. I'll do the separating. You see? And if we don't enjoy the gates, if we don't enjoy the places where his heart... You know, and really here's what happens to a lot of churches is this, is that if we don't stay at the places where God is at, what we do is we become isolated. And anybody that becomes isolated over a period of time has the distinct ability to become absolutely weird. And that's exactly what happens to a lot of churches. Instead of being out there where God has called them, where his heart is, we get off to ourselves and we start relating to ourselves and it almost becomes incestuous. And then what we find out is that we're not relating to anybody, but we're just having a nice little gathering together. I heard John Wimber talk to one pastor about this. And it was all about the concept of renewal. And he asked him this strange question because he felt like this pastor was saying, Tim, I feel like the Lord is leading me into this other type of renewal. And John asked him this question. Uh, are you willing to pay the price? And this pastor looked at him and said, well, what do you mean pay the price? And he said, pay the price of what it's going to cost because God will lift off your church and all you'll have left is a shell of a church. Now, I didn't say a hell of a church. I said a shell of a church. (laughs) And the reason why is, friends, is that God is always at the entrance gates, in my opinion. Not that he isn't doing other things in other places. But if you want to find the heart of God, that's where it is. Stay at the entrance gates. Number three is this. Everybody okay? 
That's good. I'm not getting nervous yet. <laughs> Number three is this. Know that God expects to expand his kingdom through you. Know that God expects to expand his kingdom through you. Verse four. I will record Rahab and Babylon amongst those who acknowledge me. Uh, we've been doing a series this summer on Daniel, and I'm just so impressed with Daniel. Uh, Daniel is living in a culture, friends, that is totally foreign to him. Uh, Daniel is not just a person that is surviving in Babylon, but he is actually thriving in Babylon. And I think what happens to lots of times in, in, our, in our lives is that we just kind of give up to the culture. The culture is just this incredible mass of influence upon our people, upon ourselves, and sometimes it just becomes overwhelming of just thinking, you know, there's just probably no hope here. And just to learn that God is greater than the culture, and Daniel really speaks to that whole mindset about the culture and actually stands up and because of his willingness to go through some really hard time, actually speaks to the whole culture about who this God is. And I want you to think about this in the context tonight about Babylon and Rahab. Babylon, you know, the word Babylon means spiritual confusion. And we have a society out there today that is living in absolute spiritual confusion. As a matter of fact, you go into your local Barnes and Nobles or into uh, Borders or any of your local bookstores and just go over and look at the, uh, um, you know, spiritualism that's out there, or uh, the word escapes me right now, new age, uh, tough word to come up with, huh? Uh, <laughs> and it's just huge. And we've got a lot of people that are in spiritual confusion. Rahab is really a type of Egypt, and Egypt is a type of the world, and the world is obviously a lot of people in bondage. And we have, uh, we have, we have people out there, friends, that need to hear that there is a God that is not way out there, but there is a God that can interface and interchange with those people's life and set them free from the sins that they're in. And the way that it happens is one person at a time. Um, again, I, I'm amazed at the growth that we see in our church, and yet I still have to stop and ponder this point. It's still because one person tells another person where they found bread. It's still because the word of reconciliation has been given to all of us. George Barnett says this, um, and if my, if my figures are off here a little bit, forgive me. I'm getting older. You know, something I found about older people, they aren't mean, they just don't care what other people think. Uh, and maybe that's just kind of where I'm getting now. But uh, George Barnett says this, that uh, 70% of unchurched people would come to church if somebody invited them. Do you know that uh, our nation, just with unchurched people, would be the 11th largest nation in the world? We have a harvest field out there, friends. And all of us have a responsibility of telling somebody. Um, I, uh, I'm just amazed at this statistic. We take a, we take a statistic or a, a survey in our church every year. And uh, last year we found out that 82% of our people invited somebody to church. 82%. And here's, here's why I get renewed in this whole thing and why we're responsible for those people that are in Babylon or those people that are Rahab or whatever it is, is that they're coming in. And you know what the number one phobia amongst believers is? Sharing their faith. Sharing their faith. And so I tell our people this, you invite them to church and I'll pull the trigger for you, you know? And we have found this to be very true, that it takes a long period of time for somebody to come to the Lord. Just because they come one time or two times doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to come into the kingdom. It takes a, a long time. And one of the most favorite things that I do now, and this happens probably every week, well, maybe not every week, but most, most every week, somebody will come up to me and go, ah, I invited my neighbor and they said they're going to come, you know, and then watch them like a pacing dog back and forth, waiting to see if they come. And then, the, you know, they're here, they're here. And then watch that person, that the person doesn't come and the, and the rejection and the, and the pain that they have to go through and go sit because their friend didn't show up. You see, friends, just, just hear this tonight. All of us have churches and God says, I want that one and that one, 
born in your church. And the way that it's born is because people feel like they can bring their friends. It's not just about us. As a matter of fact, uh, I think Rick Warren says this, and I really believe in it. It takes a really mature church to love the unchurched. And the reason why is because the church doesn't get what they want. It's about somebody else. It's not about them. Number four is this. A mentality of fruitfulness attracts the heart of God. A mentality of fruitfulness attracts the heart of God. Verse 5. Indeed of Zion it will be said, this one and that one is born in her, and the Most High will establish her. You know, uh, Jesus is deadly serious about fruitfulness. Uh, One day Jesus is coming into town and he goes up to a fig tree. All of you know this story. And he walks up to it and he's hungry and he looks for some figs and there's nothing on the fig tree. It looks pretty on the outside, but there's no fruit on the inside. And so he curses the tree. You know, I always ask the people, well, what do you think God did that for? Why did Jesus do that? Because he hates trees? I don't think so. Because he was going to tell his disciples something about fruitfulness that he's just deadly serious about fruitfulness. And uh, the next day, the disciples come walking into town. They go, whoa! Now, this is paraphrased. (laughs) And they look at that tree and they said, look! The tree that he cursed is dead. And the reason why Jesus did that, friends, is because he wants our lives to bear fruit. Uh, Jesus tells another story about the talents. Three people with talents. Two double theirs. One went and hid his talent. Now think about this. Jesus, meek and mild, says of the one that went and hid his, you wicked, lazy Slave. I mean, Jesus says that. I mean, he's really serious. I I think one of the things that still puts a quiver in my liver is when I think about someday that I'm going to stand before God and give an account for everything that I've done on this planet. Uh, As a matter of fact, I even think about it this way. Um, And I don't even know why I think this way. Well, I do too because I'm getting older. I I have more days behind me than I do ahead of me. You know, I... I, I'm just overwhelmed with that thought. You can ask the people that, that are here first. I just talk about this all the time. Someday I'm going to stand before God. And I have a little uh, secret to tell you. So are you. <laughs> and we're going to give an account for the things that we did here. I remember as we were preparing to move out to where we are now and uh, preparing to go there as a facility. And, that, and the Lord was really speaking to me about... Uh, barriers in my own heart. As a matter of fact, I went to a, uh, a conference. And the reason I went to this conference uh, was so that I could get away and have a small vacation, but I wasn't there to learn anything. <laughs> Anybody there? Here, you ever done anything like that? Oh, no, not you guys. Huh? <laughs> and so I went there, and the church was paying for it. It was legit and all the rest of it, but I was just going to have a few days just kind of to myself. And then this, this speaker just got me, you know, it's just like, you've ruined my whole time here, you know, I did not come here to get a word from God, I came here to rest, (laughs) and he stands up, and he says, and it's almost his opening remarks, he said this, "Uh, when I've traveled around and recognized that there are barriers in churches, usually it has to do with the senior pastor, I did, you know, it was just, it was, it was torment, and yet, this was the, a pivotal time in my heart. And I can take, as a matter of fact, I could take you out to my back porch and go to the place where I felt like, okay, God, this thing is on about fruitfulness. And it was about us making a decision to go ahead and say, okay, we're going to go ahead with this project. And, uh, and you know what my greatest fear was? You, you just, Rick just so nailed it this morning. It was... Uh, he just so nailed it. And, and it was, uh, my fear was if I really asked the people to give sacrificially, how many of them would leave? And it was the fear. You know, the Bible says 365 times, don't be afraid. And yet I find out that fear is one of those greatest barriers in my life to what God really wants to do in the area of fruitfulness. So I have to go back and say, okay, God, I'm laying it down again. And if this is what you want to do, then please 
deal with this fear in my heart. And God does it. Last one is this. Number five, refuse to allow false renewals to enter your, our lives. Refuse to allow false renewals to enter our lives. Verse seven, as they make music, they will sing all of my fountains are in you. Fountains have with it the idea of refreshing or the concept of renewal. Listen to this in Jeremiah 2.13. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And let me just tell you this. This is how it goes. You talk about being renewed. When you get to a tough place in your walk with God, whether you're a senior pastor in leadership or anything else in the church, here's what happens to us when we get to a tough part, is that we begin to fantasize what it would be like not to be in the ministry, and we begin to dig false wells. And let me tell you how it works in my life. Um, my dad was in business, and I was in business with him, and there came a time and as the church was growing that I knew, and he knew too, and he was a godly man. And uh, I had bought into the business, uh, and uh, he came to me and said, Dan, you're going to have to make up your mind. What are you going to do? And I said, well, Dad, I really feel like I'm supposed to go uh, with the church. And he says, well, I do too, but I'm going to have the attorneys draw up the papers so you can sign off your stock and give it back. And I thought, well, now wait a minute. Let's think about that. And uh, I went ahead and told him to do it. And I'll never forget the night that he it was at the church. He walked into the church uh, and he laid those, those papers out there and said, you need to sign here. And so I signed him and put him. And people, it was one of the most ambiguous moments of my life. I felt so free and I felt so vulnerable. You know, that, oh, man, I gave it away and that could have been mine. Now, here's where the real problem comes in. Is that business is still in town. And when I'm having a real tough time, in the ministry, I drive by that and I begin to fantasize. I wonder what it would be like. And friends, it's just like the peace of God just lifts off of me every time I begin to think about that. You know why? Because God hasn't called me there and that's not my foundations. It's not where God asked me to be. I can give it up if I want to and I could probably go back into business. Matter of fact, uh, the other day we were in Denver visiting our, our, our children and... Uh, Cheryl and I were driving around, and she was doing some shopping, and we found this place called Fat Burger. How many of you ever heard of Fat Burger? It's the closest thing to In-N-Out I have ever found, and I'm an In-N-Out junkie. If you don't know what In-N-Out is, God bless you. You need to find out. <clears throat> and uh, so I go in there. And you know what? You know what their slogan is? Their slogan is converting vegetarians since 1952. <laughs> And I am a man that knows cheeseburgers, and these are good. And so I start talking to the manager, you know. You know, are there franchises available and that kind of stuff, you know. And I come home and even talk to some people in my church that own restaurants and say, have you ever heard about Fat Burger? And then I just am apprehended by the Spirit of God. That's not your calling. It's not where you're, that's not where you're supposed to be. I could tell you other things, and I just want to say this. Specifically and prophetically tonight... Some of you are beginning to drill cisterns that are not of God. As a matter of fact, it's really specific. And actually, to some of you, sin is starting to look pretty good right now. And God is saying, it's a false nurture. Don't give up the foundations. Don't give up the renewal process. Come to know me and recognize that I can get you through whatever you might be going through right now. I can renew your spirit. You need to open up your mouth. You know that we talked about? Have your parameters expanded because I want to pour new wine into you. Let's stand together. I want to pray. And then Rick, if you want to have a ministry time. Uh, let's just ask the Holy Spirit to come.